A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the palace, to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. <coughs> then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. May God add his blessing to this reading. Uh, I should say, um, if you... Oh, whoops, sorry, I've turned myself off. Uh, if you did come prepared this morning to give um, to an offering, um, um, we can still take up money today for the vinic homes. Uh, they're still obviously in great need of money to... Um, uh, to set up their house for Kate's needs. Uh, so if you'd like to give, um, just come and see me at the end of the service. How about that? Um, got a huge passage today, all of chapter 15, as we look at this scene of the cross. Um, there's lots in this passage. I won't be able to get through all of it. Uh, because you can always learn more um, from the Bible. Um, but as we come to it, uh, let's ask God to come and teach us. Um, let's pray together. Uh, our Father, we come now asking that we uh, meet you again in your Son, in your Word, uh, by your Spirit. Show us again this morning uh, how you've loved us. Uh, show us the wonderful person and work of Christ, uh, that we can bring glory to you through him. Uh, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you've ever had the pleasure, uh, or perhaps the horror, uh, of stepping inside a house of mirrors. Uh, I'm hoping you'll get something of that sense this morning as we dive into Mark chapter 15. Uh, see, so as we come to Jesus' trial and crucifixion this week, uh, we see many different aspects of Jesus all emerge at the same time. Uh, it's like we look around in Mark 15 and see many and varying reflections of who the Messiah is. Uh, he is at the same time a sufferer, a servant, a substitute, a saviour, and a son. Uh, but at the same time, I hope you'll see many reflections of yourself in this chapter. Uh, not warped and distorted reflections like a house of mirrors, hopefully. Uh, but uh, for anyone who follows Jesus, uh, the cross shows us the clearest, uh, the clearest sense of what reality is, and uh, what is ultimately true of God's people. 
I hope we see many different reflections of who we are as God's people as we actually come to the cross uh, and look in the face of Christ. And nowhere more do we understand the person and work of the Messiah than at the cross. Uh, but no better do we see both the horror and, and sin uh, and the grace of God there as well. Uh, so we're going to see what the cross teaches us about Christ, but we're also going to see what the cross uh, teaches us about ourselves in Christ. Now, repeatedly in chapter 15, you might have noticed as Kay read um, these readings, um, Jesus is called the King of the Jews. Uh, but it's, uh, it's said ironically each time. A real king surely wouldn't be seen getting flogged, uh, spat on, crucified. Uh, but six times in chapter 15, someone mockingly calls Jesus the King, uh, the King of the Jews or the Messiah or the King of Israel, six times. And yet none of those times does anyone really see that what they mockingly call him, uh, even more ironically, is the truth. Uh, see, all along in Mark's Gospel, Jesus has been teaching us what being the true Messiah entails. Uh, and the first thing we learn at the cross is that Jesus was a sufferer. Uh, we didn't have this in our reading, but back in chapter 14, if you flick back, uh, Jesus had already been trialled by the high priest. He'd been accused of blasphemy. He'd been spat on. He'd been blindfolded, beaten and mocked. Uh, now it continues as Jesus is handed over to Roman authorities, uh, to this Roman authority, Pilate. I look at verse 1 in chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests, with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin, made their plans. And so they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Uh, and from here, Mark records the brutal handling of Jesus in many different ways. Um, if you're familiar with, with church, if you're familiar with uh, this story of Easter, we know uh, this brutal uh, way that Jesus handled, handled him. Uh, he's betrayed, uh, he's handed over by his own friend, he's trialled by the authorities unjustly, he's hand, uh, handed to a Gentile ruler, Pilate, uh, who eventually has him flogged, which would have been done with this brutal whip that the other Gospels uh, give us a bit more of a description of. Uh, Roman soldiers mock him verbally, they press a thorny crown into his head, and uh, they hit him on the head with a staff. They spit on him, they strip him naked, they gamble for his clothes. And after all of that, they, they nail him to a crucifix to hang to his death. Uh, but Mark doesn't just record these things to show us how much Jesus went through. Uh, as horrific as it is, uh, he does it to show how it fulfills scripture. Uh, he does it to show that he's the one the prophet Isaiah had called the suffering servant long ago. Now listen to how Isaiah speaks of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. This is Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Verse 4, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we're healed. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Now, all of these quotes come from Isaiah. This is long ago before Jesus turned up on the scene. But it was all written about him, about what would happen to this, this guy he called the suffering servant. Now, as the passage goes on, we learn that he's also the kind of sufferer depicted in Psalm 22, uh, a psalm probably written by David about a thousand years before Jesus. And Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, the first line, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you see this here as Jesus quotes that very line from the cross. And Psalm 22, verse 7, we read, All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Which again sounds like the scene of the cross. 
Psalm 22, verse 16, they pierce my hands and my, and my feet. Verse 18, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So you can see uh, how, much, how each of these verses in the Old Testament points us to Jesus' own suffering here. Now, there are many different ways Mark could have told us what happened at the cross. Uh, but the way that we hear this story fits with what was anticipated by the prophets. And Mark wants to show how much of it relates to what the scriptures had said would happen to the Messiah. And Mark drenches this story in chapter 15 uh, in references to what Isaiah said would happen, happen to the suffering servant. And what Psalm 22 shows of a suffering king to show that Jesus' suffering was no mistake. Uh, it was part of the role of the Messiah that was prophesied long ago. The Messiah would come as a sufferer. But of course this suffering would be part of this broader role of, uh, that he had as the servant. Isaiah called him God's servant. See, Jesus came as someone, uh, not as someone forced him to die on the cross, uh, but as someone who did it to serve. In his own words, in chapter 10, he said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, that's Jesus' way of picking up what Isaiah said about him long ago. I came not to be served, but to serve. I am the suffering servant. See, if you think about it, when Jesus was asked, are you the king of the Jews, in verse 2, uh, he could have said, absolutely I am, and just you wait until I overthrow Rome. Uh, that's what many people wanted him to do. But it's actually his silence in the face of this question uh, that shows us he came as a servant. He was like that lamb, silently led to the slaughter. And his purpose all along was to go to the cross in order to do something for others. And so the true Messiah came not as a warlord, but as a suffering servant. Now you might ask, why does Jesus have to suffer uh, all of this at the cross? Well, when we read Mark in light of Isaiah, Isaiah actually interprets the suffering of God's servant from two angles. Uh, and so first, Jesus suffered for our transgressions, uh, for our sin. Uh, he was pierced for our transgressions, Isaiah says. Uh, and that is, he died to deal with the human problem of sin, of our rebellion against God. But Isaiah also gives us the other side of the coin, and he says uh, that God's servant would suffer the injustice, uh, the justice of God. That is, the judgment that should have come to us, that Jesus took on himself instead. So in other words, Jesus would come as a substitute. And that was how he'd deal with our sin. In Isaiah's words, he was numbered with the transgressors. And Mark shows us that in a number of ways, uh, that in a number of ways of the cross. First, uh, look at verse 6. Now it was a custom of the festival to release a prisoner from the pe uh, whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. And the crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Now this guy Barabbas uh, that Mark mentions here was literally a murderer. Uh, he's the kind of person prisons are made for. Uh, so by giving us this detail, Mark shows us that Jesus is literally taking the cross of a murderer. A murderer goes free as he's released from prison while the most innocent man dies in his place. And we see the same thing as Jesus hangs on the cross with two criminals either side of him. Uh, Lucy mentioned this in the kids' talk. Uh, Jesus is literally numbered with the transgressors. Uh, the fact that he was crucified alongside criminals shows how out of place he is there. Uh, he, did, he doesn't belong there. But it also shows us the lengths he'd go to for us that he would stand in the place of the worst of sinners to save them. Uh, it shows us that even if we are the worst of sinners, he died in our place so that we could go free. See, the punishment for sin would see any of us there on that cross. 
But instead we see Jesus as our substitute, dying our death in our place. Now the Messiah would come as a substitute. Uh, so Jesus came as a sufferer, he came as a servant, uh, he came as a substitute. But of course this was part of being our saviour. Uh, Mark shows us this again with irony in verse 29. He says, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and bring it, uh, build it in, in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Now, the chief priests and teachers of the law, uh, they're so close to the truth here, and yet so far away. Uh, from their own lips, uh, they mock Jesus, saying, He saved others. And yet this is exactly what Jesus hung on the cross to do. See, salvation doesn't mean coming down from the cross. It means staying there until he dies a real death, a real death in our place. And he wasn't there to save himself. He didn't need saving. He was there to save others, just as they said. Um, precisely because he stayed there on the cross, he became our saviour. Now there is, of course, one last title given to Jesus at his death. Uh, and it's one that we've only seen a few times before in Mark. Uh, look at verse 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Now, Jesus is the Son. Now the centurion doesn't merely acknowledge that Jesus is a sufferer, a servant, a substitute or a saviour. He doesn't merely see him as a human messiah or a king. Uh, he says, surely this man is the son of God. That is, surely this man is king and lord and God himself. Apart from Mark's own use of it in verse 1, this title, son of God, has so far only been used by God himself. I see, what the centurion realises is what Peter, James and John heard on the mountain when they saw Jesus transfigured. And out of this cloud, God said, this is my son, listen to him. But what the centurion realises is what God spoke at Jesus' own baptism, when the heavens were torn apart, the spirit descended. And were these words that came with that act, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Uh, what Mark set out to reveal to us at the beginning of the book, the beginning of the good news, that first line in Mark, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is now heard on the lips of the least likely person at the foot of Jesus' cross. Surely this is the Son of God. See, it was the Son who came as the sufferer, as the servant, the substitute, the saviour, if he wasn't the son, he was just another sinner. If he wasn't the son, he couldn't bring us to God. If he wasn't the son, he couldn't offer us forgiveness. And what this centurion learns at the cross is that truly Jesus is the son of God. Well, I started out by talking about the experience of, of being in a house of mirrors. Uh, and so far we've seen many reflections of the Messiah, many aspects of who Jesus is, what he came to achieve at the cross. But I want to go back through the story now uh, to see what we learn about ourselves from the cross. What does the cross teach us um, about what Christ has done for us? Uh, what are the reflections, the aspects that we see here? See, when we really uh, see who Jesus was, uh, what he did, it changes us. But we have to see the horrific reflections of ourselves before we can see how God changes us through the cross. Uh, Barabbas, the released. Uh, at first, I want to take you back to this character, Barabbas. See, if Jesus was your substitute, if Jesus died in your place, then like Barabbas, 
you're the guilty set free. And uh, you might not think you're anything like Barabbas. Uh, he was a murderer. You're probably not a murderer, I hope. Uh, but what we've, got, what we've got to understand is that sinning before a holy God uh, truly deserves the punishment of death. Uh, when Christ died in our place, his death should have been ours. Uh, that, is, that is what our sin deserved. And so we see something of our sinful selves in Barabbas. Like Barabbas, we stood condemned. We were guilty rebels. But when we know the weight of our sin, then we understand that for us to go free and for Christ to die in our place is just as much a scandal as Barabbas being set free and Christ taking his place. Uh, what's crazy about this story as well is that the, the name Barabbas actually means son of the father. And so while the only true son of the father, Jesus, is crucified on that cross, Barabbas is set free. And because the true son of the father died in his place, Barabbas is given a chance to become a son of the father through the salvation Christ achieved on the cross. See, like Barabbas, we've been released from guilt and we've been given the opportunity to join the household of God. But when Christ dies in our place, we have uh, a chance to become sons of the Father, sons and daughters of the Father, the Father of God, through his Son. Another reflection we see here is in uh, a Simon, uh, this guy Simon from Cyrene, uh, the cross bearer. Uh, so we come to this guy Simon. Uh, I don't know if, it, if his name means anything like Barabbas, but the fact that we also have the names of his sons tells us he was known to Mark's original readers. Uh, Alexander and Rufus, his sons, were likely part of Mark's early Christian community. But what Simon shows us is something of what following Jesus looks like. Look at verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Uh, now that line more literally is taken, uh, they forced him to take up his cross. I actually think Mark was deliberate in saying it that way, uh, because the way those words come here, take up his cross, is the same way they came back in chapter 8, when Jesus described what following him would look like. Uh, when he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so we're reminded of what discipleship looks like as we come and watch Simon uh, take up this cross, take up his cross, it says. Obviously meaning Jesus' cross. And yet, yet uh, it appoints us to taking up our own cross and following Jesus. Um, see, what Mark's doing here, he's using this story of Simon carrying Jesus' cross to show us vividly what it looks like to follow Jesus. Uh, given Simon's sons were known to Mark's audience, this story literally showed the early Christians that following Jesus would feel like what Jesus felt. Carrying that cross uh, was difficult. Walking with mockers on either side being exposed to the violence that Jesus attracted. But ultimately, uh, with Simon, we arrive at the cross and we see Jesus hanging there and not us. See, our cross-bearing might involve suffering. It might, might involve participating in the shame Jesus received. But in the end, we're Simon, the cross-bearer, not Jesus, the Saviour. Our cross-bearing is not for our own salvation, but we take up our own crosses in solidarity with the one who saved us by his own death on the cross for us. Uh, we come to the centurion then. Uh, third, we see our own reflection in the centurion. Uh, now, this centurion probably had oversight of the crucifixion of Jesus. And he may well have been the guy who put Jesus to death. And yet all of the people, of all the people we come across in Mark's Gospel, uh, he's the first to announce uh, that Jesus is the Son of God. 
But there's the scandal of the cross again. How God, re God reveals himself by unfathomable grace to the very people who put Jesus to death. Uh, that's you and I by our sin. Uh, and so we see in the centurion a picture of ourselves. Because of our sin, we put Christ on that cross. And yet God has been so gracious to reveal himself to us in spite of it, that we might know him fully, that we might find forgiveness in that very act of Jesus dying in our place. Uh, finally, we come to the women in verse 40. Uh, we read some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed Jesus and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Now, it's hard to tell if this reflects positively or negatively on the women, uh, watching all of this unfold from a distance. Uh, these women uh, watch from, from back, from seeing the cross from a distance. But I think we see a reflection of our own discipleship here as well. See, like these women, we experience the scene of the cross from a distance. And we're removed from the scene itself. We didn't have to die on that cross or experience its horrors face to face. And yet, even at a distance, it means so much to us. That the cross is our freedom, our forgiveness. It's our rescue, our ransom. And so we see Jesus not having to be there ourselves, not having to endure, and endure the suffering of the cross ourselves. Uh, but we watch from a distance, remembering what our Lord did for us. Now we're very close to the end of Mark's Gospel. We've spent the whole term in this Gospel. Uh, but of course the cross is not the end of the story. Uh, in fact, for Mark, even at the end of this book, uh, we're really only seeing, only seeing the beginning of the gospel. Uh, the way that Mark begins this, his story in, of Mark, in, in chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, well, that's what we see here at the cross. Uh, in Jesus' death, we have the beginning of the good news. Uh, it's the beginning, uh, the end of the beginning. Uh, with or the beginning and the end, whichever way you want to see it. Uh, that the good news of the re resurrection of Christ is still coming. Uh, and for the rest of that story, we'll have to come back on Sunday. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, our Father, uh, we want to thank you for the cross. We thank you, Father, for all that we see at the cross. For all that it reveals about you, your love, your service, your suffering. Uh, uh, the fact that you came as a saviour, uh, that you sent your own son uh, to die on the cross for us. And Father, for all that it reveals about us as we find salvation in Christ, uh, Father, that we have come to know the Son, uh, that we watch from a distance, that, we, uh, that we've uh, been released as Christ died as our substitute. Uh, forgiven, let go, and yet that we also have a cross to carry ourselves. Father, by this good news, we pray that you give us uh, everything that we need uh, to take up the life of discipleship following Jesus as our Lord, as our Saviour, as our servant, as our sufferer, as our King, as your Son. And Father, we pray all of these things in his name.